to the Simple Steps Personal Finance Podcast. Bringing personal finance to you step by step. This is episode 13. Thanks for joining me. Before we start, I want to tell you that my Christmas and New Year discount offer is now finished. Now I'll be busy onboarding those new clients over the next few weeks. I've extended my working hours to allow for more free initial phone inquiries. If you want help with your personal finance, book a free call with me through the website. That's sspf.co.uk slash book, B-O-O-K, and I'll call you for a chat. If I can help you and you want to proceed, I can show you that you'll benefit more than I cost you. It's a free call, so an inquiry costs you nothing and could gain you a lot. In this episode, I want to follow on from the topic we started in episode 11. That is, how to protect your finances against life's risks. In that episode, we talked about life insurance to protect against death, with an emphasis on the cost-effective term insurance and avoiding the commission's bloated, misguided investment vehicle that is whole-of-life life insurance. Term insurance is preferred because it protects from a death during a given window of time, And should that occur, it would indeed be catastrophic to your life or those that you leave behind. So having a sum of money in place would make sure that there wasn't a second catastrophe afterwards in the form of a financial breakdown. There are other areas that protection is required, however. What would happen if you became too ill to work? Perhaps a stroke or a heart attack occurred out of the blue, or a chronic back pain developed that worsened over time or you developed arthritis that led to you being unable to perform your job, or a motor-based condition caused your health to deteriorate. Being unable to work is a double-edged sword. There's the cost of living, as well as having no income. Is there any way to protect your finances from a long-term inability to carry out a job? Yes, there is. Usually where there's a market, there is insurance. And in this instance, it's called Income Protection Insurance, IPI. This is a monthly income amount paid every month until the end of the policy. Now, historically, it was called Permanent Health Insurance because it would stay in place permanently, regardless of the number of claims over the period of insurance. But that name is a bit unclear. So now it's called Income Protection Insurance or IPI. Though the policy cannot be cancelled by the insurer if you claim on it a lot, the premiums you are paying are often reviewable every few years, so consider it to work something akin to car insurance. You can cancel it by not paying the premiums, and they'll cancel it if you don't, and the premiums reflect your claim status over the last few years. But how does it work, and what do you need to know about it? Well, first off, the insurer takes a look at your age and your profession, After all, there are some that are more dangerous than others. A a PA and a a deep-sea diver won't face the same daily risks going about their work, and the young are less likely to have medical issues than the not-so-young. They'll look at how long you want the policy to last. Now, if you were struck down with the inability to work, then you'd likely require this cover to stay in place until another source of income arrived, and that might be as far away as claiming your pension at retirement. So these policies can last 30 or 40 years until retirement. They then will ask you how much you want to protect. That is, how much income do you want to be paid each month if you were unable to work? Now that sounds like a blank check, doesn't it? And they know that too. So the insurers tend to limit the amount payable to around 65% or 75% of your net pay, your your take-home pay. That way you're not incentivized to make up excuses and try not to work again. Once you agree on an amount and the length of the policy, they present you with a premium. Now, here's an example. A man aged 40, who is a doctor, wants a 25-year-old policy until he retires at 65. He wants £6,000 a month. Now, he is a doctor after all. He's a non-smoker, but his profession puts him at a slightly higher risk of illness as he's likely interacting with sick patients. Now, his premium would be £225 a month. Now that sounds expensive, but it would potentially pay out £1.8 million if he needed to claim almost straight away. 
Now, for an office-dwelling woman of age 35, working in administration, wanting a, a 30-year policy till her retirement, covering just £1,000 a month, again, a non-smoker in good health, this would cost around £25 per month. So there's a real range to the premiums. There's a real range of affordability. It's important to mention that if this policy was claimed very soon after she took it out, it could pay off £1,000 a month for 30 years. So £360,000 or so. But similarly, she may not claim until the 29th year of the 30-year policy, in which case it would pay out £12,000 for last year. And her premiums would have been around £9,000 by that time. But this is insurance, after all. When you insure your car for the year, you don't expect a refund if you don't claim at the end of the year. Because you were protected during that time too. Same here. Come to the end of the policy, her pension would start to pay out for retirement, as guaranteed an income you'd ever expect in life. And the security of income protection insurance is no longer required. Now, if it was being claimed in the run-up to retirement then you'd hope that retirement income would be enough to replace this income protection monthly payout. What else is there to mention? Some insurers will cover your ability to perform your own occupation. Some will offer lower premiums if you are only unable to perform a similar occupation of which you have the right education, skills or training, meaning you might have to take up a different job because the insurance wouldn't cover you otherwise. Some insurers will even offer lower premiums as they protect only if you cannot perform any job. The most comprehensive insurance is to protect your own occupation, and that usually will have the highest premium. My earlier examples were own occupation quotes. I myself wouldn't want to be 45 years old and asked to perform a largely different job to the one I've been doing for 15-20 years as a result of being incapacitated in some way. But it's each to their own, obviously. That's why there's a range of insurances. Another big effect on premiums is the speed that the insurer has to start paying out to you. Or put a different way, how long after you became incapable of working do their payments to you need to start? The term for this is deferral period. Say you get six months full sick pay from your employer, then having IPI kick in straight away will be overkill. You could afford to defer for six months, or 26 weeks as they like to work in weeks, before the IPI needed to pay out. If you had three months sick pay, you could defer only 13 weeks. A longer deferral would mean a cheaper monthly premium, like for like, because they have less to pay out. And there is more time where your inability may change nature, or you find ways to keep working. And stuff like the flu or a bout of the measles doesn't lead to them making payouts. After all, there's nothing to say that your condition would never improve either, meaning this type of policy covers the period where you recuperated. If you had to claim later on again and even again, you could, hence the old name of permanent health insurance, but the nature of the policy could be transitionary. Another thing that makes policies more expensive is if you want them to backdate payments to day one. Now deferring for 26 weeks, then starting payments is cheaper than deferring 26 weeks, then having the policy pay you out on the six months you deferred. Most policies start payments at the same time as the deferral period finishes to keep things clean and keep policy costs down. Last thing I want to mention about them too. If you get a policy like this through work, which is not uncommon, then the money it paid to you if you had to claim, would be taxable. This is because employers can class this as a business expense and use it to reduce their corporation tax bill. The money that is paid to you is then taxable because the government always gets a cut. On the flip side though, if you pay for a policy yourself, that is, using your take-home pay, your after-tax money, then the policy will pay out tax-free. That's because the government got its slice of your money when they taxed you on your salary, so they don't take a second bite if you get income from a protection policy. So that's the idea behind IPI, income protection insurance, a security blanket against being incapable of working, not choosing not to work. A policy that pays an agreed amount of monthly income if you become unable to work until you either recover 
pass away, retire, or the policy lifespan runs out, depending on which happens first and how long the policy was for, obviously. Now, there are other forms of protection for your income. A very common one is a shorter term version of the income protection insurance we've just looked at. Consider that one to be the gold standard of protecting your income. A more common alternative might be accident and sickness insurance. Often this can cover unemployment or redundancy also. The name is then abbreviated to ASU insurance, accident, sickness and unemployment. This is different because of a few reasons. The most important being that the period that you are covered for is somewhere between three months and two years. It's designed to cover you short term only. Also, the premiums will be annually reviewed and the insurer may even withdraw the policy from availability. The review will assess whether your health and employment status have changed in that time and whether the insurer wants to continue to offer a policy. Let's say that you became aware that you were about to be made redundant. Then you couldn't take out this policy. You'd be misrepresenting yourself. But if you have one in place already and you are made redundant, then the policy will pay the agreed amount for the agreed amount of time. If the insurer has lost lots of money due to an economic downturn, they may pull any policies at renewal time. An extreme instance, but one that shows the difference between accident sickness insurance and income protection insurance. Now ASU would tend to pay a replacement income if you were made unemployed, and they would tend to pay a lump sum if you were in an accident. Lose a leg in a car accident, expect a lump sum. Lose your job, expect a monthly payout. Get ill, likely the policy will pay an income monthly. Policies of this nature tend to be limited to around 2,000 pounds a month, limited to 75% or so of your take-home pay. They're designed to cover your essential living costs for a short-term time frame. Get yourself fired deliberately, they won't pay. Drink yourself into an accident, it won't pay. Like all insurance, you can't self-inflict and expect a payout. But have the right intentions and the right circumstances, and a policy like this can rarely help you weather a tough period. A deferred 18-month policy for ASU with a fully stocked rainy day fund of six months' expenses should cover more than a reasonable amount of time to go find another job. A policy that pays out immediately after getting laid off for six months will protect you for a while if you had no savings whatsoever. It's worth saying also that the employment aspect to this policy can make insurers jittery, so some only cover accident and sickness. Some offer a standalone unemployment policy if that's just the bit that you want to cover. The redundancy element. There are lots of types, variations and qualities to these policies. So prepare to do some homework if you wanted to take one out. Oh, and paying out of after-tax income means the benefit is tax-free, just like IPI. So for the gold standard income protection insurance for long-term coverage, or this accident, sickness and unemployment for short-term coverage, there are policies that will protect your income against external factors. Redundancy, accident, sicknesses, chronic health issues. They can be insured against with the right policy. The final type of protection I want to talk about today is along similar lines to these, but is more aligned to your health. If you were to suffer a stroke or have a heart attack or develop a major cancer, there's a type of policy that pays you a lump sum. This policy pays you a lump sum virtually instantly. It's called critical illness cover. So why a lump sum and not a monthly payment? Well, you may need to make alterations to your house to allow for a change in your quality of living and your ability to move freely. You may wish to pay off any debts with a lump sum to free you of the associated stress that comes with them. You may need to buy or pay for home help or some sort of medical machinery. For instance, you might need to do kidney dialysis at home. If you were diagnosed with a terminal illness, you may wish to scratch some items off your bucket list and a lump sum would enable such adventures. Now you could develop a cancer, receive your lump sum payout 
have treatment and recover. You don't have to give the money back, but the policy will have ceased because of the payout. And it's essential to note that not all illnesses are covered. Each insurer has a list. Cancers would have to be of certain types. Strokes would have to result in permanent symptoms. Heart attacks of a a specified severity. But things like multiple sclerosis or motor neurone disease, paralysis, deafness, blindness, organ transplants, and a list of other serious ailments are all covered. So the coverage for these policies is important and it can vary. Now the body who oversees insurers, the ABI or Association of British Insurers, has given out guidelines to try to reduce variation in the market and over time that is having the desired effect. The important thing for me to put across to you here though is that CIC or critical illness cover exists. It's often given as part of an employer's benefits package but it can be bought by an individual. Your employer may offer one or two times salary as CIC it would be taxable as it's coming from your employer. But would it be enough? If you earn £25,000 a year and had £100,000 left on your mortgage, would two times salary be enough? You may be diagnosed with a recoverable form of cancer. You may wish to use the money to pay off the mortgage, but it would be insufficient. It depends on what you hope to achieve with the money as to how much coverage you should have in place. The self-employed or those in partnerships don't have the benefits packages that large companies offer their employees. So you may wish to protect your business by covering yourself or your partners against illness or accident. Where would your income come from if you were unable to work anymore? Would state benefits be enough or would extra support be required? If your partner developed an illness, would a lump sum provide the amount needed to employ temporary cover until they returned? Arguably, these policies are even more important to entrepreneurs and small business owners. Now, bringing these policy descriptions together, you might opt to have no coverage at all. Your employer may offer generous sick pay, a reasonable amount of accident and critical illness coverage, and your job is rock solid. That may apply to some of you. Or you might have a bit less job security, so you have an unemployment policy to protect against redundancy. You have income protection insurance to protect against incapacity from six months until retirement, with an amount of critical illness cover large enough to pay off your mortgage and your car loan and provide some bucket list money just in case. Or maybe you're a sole trader and you want to protect yourself against ill health with IPI and a lump sum through CIC. The possibilities are endless. Only you know your circumstances and how much it would take to give you peace of mind. And then you have to weigh that up with how much you could afford to pay monthly for these protection policies. Where there's a risk, there is often insurance. When you have dependents, there are responsibilities. Somewhere there's a place where these things collide. And you may find that income protection policies or critical illness cover can stop that collision from being catastrophic. Next time I want to look at the practicalities of paying off debts. How implementing the snowball method might not make perfect mathematical sense, but fits with your behaviour as a human being. And the importance of building up a momentum to fighting debt, so that you can reclaim ownership of your income. In the meantime though, check out my blog at sspf.co.uk slash blog for more financial common sense. Don't forget to spread the word. Financial peace of mind is here to stay. Simple Steps and my personal finance coaching are here to help. If you're finding this approach useful but are unsure on how to act, drop me a line and let's see how personal finance coaching can help you. After all, what could be better than having personal guidance tailored to your circumstances? Book your free consultation at sspf.co.uk slash book. B-O-O-K. Thanks for listening. That's it for episode 13. For more information, check out the website for show notes and transcripts for each episode. This podcast is copyright of Simple Steps Personal Finance Limited and can be shared freely. The SSPF podcast is available as direct download on Android, RSS, iTunes, Stitcher, Mixcloud, YouTube, Vimeo and more. We're here however you want us. If you like what you're hearing, 
please leave a review so others know to listen in too. Thanks as always to partners in line for the music used throughout this podcast. See you next time.